Bayside Folsom, we good this morning? All right. Well, hey, it, it, it really is good to be with you. Can we just take a second? Uh, can you give it up for your pastors, Brian Hopkins and Brandon Short? Literally two of the most encouraging people on the planet. If my phone ever rings and it's Brandon or Brian, I answer, no matter where we are, because you just know you're going to get off that phone call and you're going to feel a lot better about your life. Uh, you guys are very uh, blessed to have both of them here. Uh, and I am blessed to be here. I'm excited to be here. My first time uh, preaching at Bayside Full. So I've been here uh, a couple of times, been at Bayside for 12 years. So uh, I, I saw Folsom when it was just, you know, a little thing. And now it's a big thing. And you guys are crushing it. Uh, I think we have a picture of my family. Uh, so that's my wife, Charmaine. You may know her, part of Thrive Worship. Uh, that is my soon-to-be five-year-old son, Carter Scott. And then my beautiful baby girl, Zaya June, she is two and a half. And uh, if you, so my wife, if you know her, is Australian, or if you've ever heard her, she's Australian. So uh, nationality-wise, she's uh, they're from Australia, but um, by blood, they're actually Chilean, and I am very white. And so our children are very racially confused, but... Even though they look like dad, they're very white as well. They're also uh, half Chilean. And so we have a really good time. Uh, they, my wife and my daughter are over at Bayside Adventure. And then me and Carter are here today and hanging with our Bayside Folsom fam. So really good to be here. Uh, hey, if you have a Bible or if you've got your phone, I want to invite you to pull that out. We're going to be continuing our series, uh, Unstoppable. If you don't, don't worry, it's all going to be up here on the screen. But Acts chapter 5 is where we're going to be. <clears throat> I'm going to read it, and then we're going to jump in, starting in verse 12. Here we go. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. So uh, if you've been coming for a few weeks, you probably have a little bit of the lay of the land. Acts is a book in the Bible that immediately follows the gospel story. So Jesus came, uh, he died, he rose again, and then it's like the Acts is the book that it's like, well, what now? What's happening now? And so we follow the early church as they begin to set up what's going to become the church. But what's really interesting about this early portion of Acts is that the disciples the apostles, the believers, there's something different about them. Because if you go back and you read the Gospels when Jesus was on earth and they're walking around with Jesus, they're not very impressive. In fact, more times than not, Jesus would have to say something and then they, they would look at him, the disciples, and they'd be like, Jesus, explain it to us like we're five. And he's like, all right, for the third time. And he would have to explain it to them again because they understood nothing, right? And then Jesus goes into the garden and he's praying and it's right before he's about to be captured and killed. And all the disciples are asleep. And then Jesus goes on trial and they go to Peter and they're like, hey, don't you know Jesus? And he's like, who, me? Nope, never heard of the guy. And then you fast forward to the book of Acts. And these guys are getting thrown in prison. They're being threatened with death. And still, they keep preaching. And still, they keep healing. And you're like, man, something's different about this group. When you get to the book of Acts, something is different about the believers, the disciples, the apostles. They sound different. They feel different. They look different. And so naturally you go, what happened? That they went from kind of this like group that didn't really get it and and more than that, they were kind of run by their insecurity and their lack of education and, and their fear. And then all of a the sudden, they, 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 they turn the early church into one of the greatest forces for good the world has ever seen. You know, how did that happen? Because from the Gospels to Acts, they look like completely different people. And as you pull the story apart, you start to understand that there were things from their time with Jesus that they didn't bring with them into the, the timeline of Acts. So my wife is Australian, so we got married in Sydney, actually, and, and so we go back and forth there quite a bit. Our kids are pretty well-traveled, um, and it's a long flight. 
And we were actually just there in November. And so we took our family, and we have one rule uh, when we travel internationally, and that is, is that there are no rules for screen time. Uh, and my son loves it because every seat, he's got his own TV, and he can control it, and people bring him snacks. He's like, what is this life? He looks at my wife and I, and he's like, hey, we need to make some changes around our house. Okay, this setup is what I would like at home. And we're like, fat chance. But only when we fly international. Like, Carter, you can watch as many movies as you want. Whatever you got to do so I don't go viral for losing my mind as a parent on a plane. Okay, whatever you got to do. So our kids love it. So this last time in November, uh, we're flying to, uh, we had our connecting flight through Auckland, New Zealand, and then from Auckland to Sydney. And it's about a 13-hour flight from San Francisco to Auckland. And so <clears throat> we strap in. You kind of have to, like, mentally click in and just prepare for 13 hours of misery in case somebody decides they're not sleeping anymore as a human being. And uh, we're going, I'm on the far side. Uh, my daughter's next to me. My wife's next to my daughter. And then my son's on the, the, the other far side. So my wife falls asleep. I got my daughter. We're, we're doing our thing. And uh, they, they bring fruit by. The stewardess brings fruit by. Uh, so my kids were raised on veggies and fruit. That's all my wife feeds them. I don't partake, but they do, and it's great for them. And so veggies and fruit. And so my son loves fruit, and they just kept bringing him fruit. But uh, we got to the point where, like, 30 minutes from landing in Auckland, and, and they go, hey, you know, start, you know, tray tables up, all of that stuff. And my son is sitting there. My wife's still asleep. My son's sitting there, and he's got, like, seven plates full of fruit on his little pull-down thing. And he's looking at it, and he goes, I can't throw this away because I really love fruit. And both of my kids have these little, they're like dogs, but they have a compartment, and we put all of their plane activities in them. They're little carry-on bags, but they also have wheels, and so we roll them through the airport. And so my son has this brilliant idea. He said, I can't possibly eat all of this fruit right now. So he starts stuffing all of this fruit in his little carry-on bag. I had no idea because I'm on the other side of the road with my daughter. My wife's still sleeping, and he stuffs all of this fruit, closes his bag. We're good. So we kind of get up, pack up, like everything's good. We walk off the plane, and he's pulling his little carry-on bag. And we walk through customs. And if you've flown internationally, if you've flown internationally, you know uh, there are things that nations don't like you to bring with you when you walk through customs, right? And uh, there's a bunch of agents there, and they've got dogs. And I bet you didn't know this. You knew about drug dogs, right? I bet you didn't know they have fruit dogs. <laughs> and so I'm walking my four-year-old son, and all of a sudden, one of those dogs walks up, and he's just on point. You ever seen a dog go on point? He just stops, and his whole body goes stiff, and he's just staring at my son's little briefcase. And immediately, like, seven agents show up, and they're like, sir, you have to come with us. And so I was like, me and my four-year-old, I'm like, what's happening? They put the suitcase up on the thing, and they're like, sir, do you know what's in here? I'm like... Is my four-year-old smuggling cocaine? <laughs> How did this happen without my knowledge? And I'm not even getting a cut. <laughs> and I said, I have no idea. It's just, no, it's just, we, you know, it's, it's nothing. And when you go through customs, they always ask you the same question, right? Do you have anything to declare? Or you'll get a little, a little piece of paper on the plane, and you have to fill out, like, do you have $10,000 of cash? That's never going to apply to us. Um, do you have produce, right? They don't like produce because a lot of stuff comes with produce. So do you have anything to declare? I'm like, no, we have nothing to declare. It's just his activities for the plane in there. And so he opens the suitcase, and fruit falls everywhere. And I'm looking at the fruit, and I'm looking at him, and I wonder how many times he's heard this one. Because I'm looking at the fruit, and I'm looking at him, and I look back at the fruit, and I say, how did that get in there? <laughs> and I really had no idea until I put two and two together that Carter just started stuffing this fruit into the suitcase. He's like, sir, you cannot bring this into New Zealand. I was like, I wasn't trying. It was my four-year-old. <laughs> so uh, my son Carter's doing five to seven years in a New Zealand prison. <laughs> but we're coming for you, Bubba. So we're going to take a third offering, actually, for bail at the end of this service. Uh, hoping we can get him out. But we, we, we travel a lot internationally, and, and it's the same question every time. Do you have anything to declare? Which is just an, a fancy way of asking you, is there anything that you're trying to bring with you that you can't bring with you? Is there anything that you're trying to bring with you that can't come in here? And what I love about the Gospels, what I love about Scripture, 
is that any time somebody starts following God, whether it's in biblical times or today in 2024, did you know that every day of your life you will be asked the same question? Do you have anything to declare? Is there anything that you have been carrying with you that cannot enter into the kingdom of God? Because this is exactly what Peter was asked. Right? Peter denies Jesus. Jesus comes back from the dead. He meets with Peter. And he says, Peter, three times, right? Do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. Like, what? Do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. What is Jesus asking him? Do you have anything to declare, Peter? Are you still carrying fear and insecurity with you? Are you still carrying foolishness and, and acting brash and, and letting your emotions steer the ship? But when you say yes to Jesus, when you walk with God, you will be asked that question. Because there are things from before. There are things from your old life, things from your previous life that you cannot bring with you into the kingdom of God. And this is an important question to ask. And it's an even more important question to answer. Because all of us, every week, we walk in those doors, into church, carrying baggage from the past. But walking through those doors, God, God doesn't want you to deny that you were ever wounded, deny that you were ever hurt, deny that you ever did something you shouldn't have done. But when you say yes to Jesus and you enter into the kingdom of heaven, no longer can you bring those things with you because no longer can they make the decisions in your life. Because those things don't define you anymore. So it's the same question that was asked to Peter. It's the same question that was asked to my four-year-old on the plane. It's the same question that's being asked to us today. Did you walk into this room carrying something with you that God is just waiting for you to put down? Something that's holding you down. Something that's weighing you down, holding you back. Because when you enter into the kingdom of God, there are certain things that must be left behind. He didn't want what used to be. He wants you to step into something new. And the believers, they knew this. And that's why in the book of Acts, we start to see the church looks different. The disciples look different. The apostles look different. On this side of the resurrection, they might as well be different people. They're not doing the things they used to do, making the decisions they used to make. Something has changed for the disciples. And you can tell because in verse 13 it says this, no one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. No one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. Can we be honest on this Sunday morning? Uh, would you say Big C Church, the global church, the church as a whole, would you say in 2024 that the church, Christians, believers are highly regarded by the rest of the world? No! No! Because we, we take our Bibles, we walk outside these walls, poof, poof, you voted for who? Poof, and we just pummel people with them. We are not highly regarded. I had a, we had a family friend, uh, her daughter was getting her first job, and we're talking about it, and she goes, Cam, I'm just, I'm just really worried about what they're going to think of me when they find out I'm a Christian. I'm like, well, how are they going to find out about that? And she's like, well, I'm going to tell them. I was like, in what world do we lead with that? Complete stranger. Hi, I'm Cameron. I'm a Christian. Born again. How are you? We don't even do that with politics. Hey, I'm Lefty Lisa. Nice to meet you. I am Republican Josh. It's like, stop Republican Josh. What if they just got to know you? Because you're pretty cool. And then once they get to know you, they start to know Jesus because you carry Jesus in you. But it's really important to point out that you do not have to sacrifice the conviction of your beliefs to be highly regarded. They, they, they were following the mission of God. They were carrying out the mission of God. And they did it in a way that everybody highly regarded them. They were thought well of. You know, in fact, they did a social study a couple years ago. <clears throat> they grabbed 50 people who didn't know each other, 50 random people. They stuck them in a room. And you're like, yeah, Cameron, let's call church on a Sunday. <laughs> and they gave them no instruction. They stuck them in a room for an hour. Only one person in this room had gotten instructions before entering into this room. And they told this person, all they said was, you cannot reveal anything about yourself. All you can do is ask questions. So the 49 other people, no instructions. This one person, his only rule, don't reveal anything about yourself, just ask questions. The hour goes by. 
They pull everybody out of the room. And do you know who 49 people unanimously said was the most interesting person they ran into in the room was? It was the person who was asking the questions. Isn't it crazy? The most interesting people are the most interested people. We've lost this in 2024. The church has lost the ability to be interested in people. Man, society has lost the ability to be interested in people. And what's so crazy, it says, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. The church didn't exist for the church. It was for the world. It was for the people. We cannot make church a thing where we show up on a Sunday and church stays here. This is not what the church was meant to be. It's meant to go and make disciples. To go and love to all four corners of the world. The church was never created for the church. The church was created for the world. We have to start being interested in people again. We have to start asking questions again. Jesus was famous for asking questions. And it says, among the people, the disciples went out and they performed signs and wonders. Look what happens when the church is out among the people. It says, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Man, when the church doesn't keep what it has to itself, when it goes among the people, when it's interested in the people, more and more people, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and the number was added. That's what happens is people meet Jesus. But if you're like me, Slightly cynical, slightly skeptical. You're like, well, of course. If Brandon shows up next Sunday and starts performing miracles, I'm going to believe. Right? If I see somebody perform a miracle, I'm going to believe. Here's the problem with that theory. All throughout the New Testament, all throughout Scripture, people saw signs, wonders, and miracles and still walked away. People saw Jesus go to the cross and then show up three days later and they still didn't believe. You say, well, how is that even even possible? It's because in in this text, and really in the story of the early church, we learn two very important things about miracles. The first one is this, is that the miracle itself was never the point. The miracle always points us to God. Miracles always point to God. I had a mentor of mine tell me one time, he said, Cameron, you will always find what you're looking for. I thought, that's cute. Might tweet that later. Put it on a coffee cup, give it to my grandma. You always find what you're looking for. It feels like a feel good, right? And he goes, well, let let me explain. He said, if you wake up in the morning, and if you're looking for a reason to be frustrated or upset with your spouse, you'll find it. He goes, if if you wake up in the morning and you're looking for a reason to feel like a failure as a parent, you're (laughs) going to find a lot of that. (laughs) He goes, if you look at the political landscape and you're looking for a reason to feel hopeless, and helpless, and like the sky is falling, he said, you're going to find it. He said, but if you wake up in the morning and you look for reasons to have hope, you will find it. If you look for reasons to have joy, you will find it. You want to know why? I said, why? He said, because we're only ever looking for the wrong things. And it's all rooted in this beautiful verse, Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. What's Jesus saying? Is that no matter your circumstances, there's no asterisk, there's no footnote. It just says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Jesus is promising, no matter how great your life is going or how terrible your life is going, if you're looking for Jesus, you will find him. It doesn't matter who gets elected. It doesn't matter what the economy is doing. If you are looking for Jesus, you will find him. And I fear that in 2024, church, the church has stopped looking for Jesus. Everywhere in my life, i got to look for Jesus. Why? Because it's promised I will find him. i got to stop looking for cynicism. i got to stop looking for bitterness. i got to stop looking for fear. We gotta start looking for Jesus. And the same is true with the miracles. Why did people see miracles and still walk away and still not believe? Because even in the miracle, they weren't looking for Jesus. Did you know you could come to church every Sunday and still not see Jesus? You could be part of a small group and still not see Jesus. 
You could do all of the right things and still not see Jesus. The question I want to ask you this morning is, what are you looking for? Because so many days in my life, I've woken up and I've looked for the wrong things. But you know what scripture promises? That if you look for Jesus, regardless of how well your life is going or horrible it is, you will find him. But you can also find him in the miracle. Because the miracles were never about the miracle. It was never about the healing. It was never about the blind being able to see. It was always pointing us back to Jesus. It was always pointing us back to Jesus. So we have to see miracles for what they are. You know, a lot of people will say that miracles are just a suspension of the natural order. But that's not true at all. In fact, one theologian said this. The miracles of Jesus and the disciples are the only natural things in a broken and unnatural world. Miracles are the only natural things. Why? Because you and I live in a broken, unnatural, fallen world. And miracles are actually a glimpse of what God always intended. Why? Because the blind were always meant to see. The lame were always meant to walk. The sick were always meant to be healthy. And so if you go back all the way back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and you see life in the garden, you start to understand that that was always the plan. That miracles are actually a glimpse of what was, what should be, and most importantly, what will be again. And yet all along, they're always pointing us back to Jesus. Don't see the healing and miss the healer. The miracles were always about Jesus. So the first thing that they do is they point us to God. But the second thing miracles do is they move us to God. The text says this, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Man, I look at this and I think, what a tragedy it would have been if all of these sick, lame, blind, spiritually afflicted people showed up. And all they got was a healing. If all they got was the ability to walk again. If all they got was the ability to see again. What a tragedy that would be. But that's not where their story ends. Verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more women and men believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Friends, the miracle is not how it happened. The miracle is not that the, the eyes were open, that the lame could walk, that the sick were healthy. The miracle was not how it happened. The miracle was how it ended. That it ended with them meeting Jesus. Because the miracle is not going to solve all of their problems for the rest of their lives. In fact, Jesus promises this in the garden shortly before he gets arrested and goes to the cross. He tells his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. So not being able to see, that's not the last problem that guy's going to have. There's going to be so many more. The miracle is not how it happened, it's how it ended. Miracles are always moving us to God. In fact, we actually see a crazy story in Mark chapter 2. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a group of guys that had a friend who couldn't walk, and so they cut a hole in the roof to get him to Jesus. You heard that story? You ever ask, like, read stuff in the Bible and then ask the question, okay, but why did they do that? And the Bible makes it clear, like, there was standing room only. Like, the house was packed. They couldn't get in. And then I go, yeah, but why, why would I did they, like, ask? If you're carrying a guy that can't walk, and you walk up to me and go, excuse me, can I get past you? I'm not going to say no. But I've seen these type of people before, because these types of people are my wife. Just too polite. You know what I'm talking about? We go to Disneyland, and I will, I have, so do you want a tip for Disneyland? This is totally free this morning. My tip for Disneyland is the same strategy if you meet a bear in the wild. You make yourself as big as possible, and you make a lot of noise. And so when I'm, like, trying to funnel into the queue, like, the line for a ride, I just make myself as big as possible, and then I just barrel in, <laughs> fully trusting and hoping and believing that Charmaine, my wife, is right behind me, right? I barrel into the line. But if it's a, if it's a popular ride, right, everybody's trying to get in. And so I get in, settle into the queue, and I look back. And my wife made it in, but she's, like, 12 people behind me. I'm not going to her because 12 people in that line is, like, 20 minutes of waiting, Right? So I'm like, and she's too polite. She will not tell the people, that's my husband, can I, can I get past you? And so, you know, we start doing the gesture tug of war. But you, you want to be subtle because you don't want to be weird, right? So you're both doing like this. And then they get to the angry gestures, right? And I'm trying to invite her up, but she's too polite. I'm like, just tell them that's my husband because I'm not coming back. My wife would rather 
wait in a three-hour line separated by 12 people than just push through, right? And that's how these guys must have been. Their friend's like, hey, how are we going to get to Jesus? The house is packed. And they're like, I don't know. He's like, why don't you just ask them if they'll get out of the way? And they're like, no, we can't do that, man. And so the lame guy's like, well, what's the plan then? And they're like, we're going to cut a hole in the roof. <laughs> and he's like, I don't like this plan. Because you have to carry me up onto the roof. They're like, yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> and this group of guys carries him onto the roof and then cuts a hole in it. And then we see a couple chapters before where we're at is that, <laughs> that somebody had carried this lame man that Peter has this interaction with to the gate and home from the gate every day. Somebody did that. And then right here in Acts chapter 5, we see they start doing signs and wonders and miracles. And it says, everybody started bringing the sick. Everybody started bringing the lame and the blind. What does that mean? This is the beauty of the gospel, friends. That when it comes to experiencing the healing power of Jesus in your life, it doesn't always have to be your faith. Sometimes somebody else's faith can usher you into the presence of God. Sometimes you need somebody else to carry you into the presence of God. In the story in Mark chapter 2, it says that when Jesus saw their faith, he healed the man. It wasn't his faith. It was his friend's faith. What does this mean? It means that the church was not built for the church. I cannot keep this to myself. And it means that there are people in your lives who have been praying and waiting for a miracle, not knowing they've been praying and waiting for you to have faith for them, to have hope for them. Because sometimes when you're walking through divorce, it can be really hard to have faith every day. It can be really hard to maintain hope for your kids when your house is falling apart. When you lose a job, it can be really hard to keep faith to keep hope, to keep encouraged. When you lose a loved one, it can be really hard to have faith. Sometimes you need somebody to have faith for you. Because I can't tell you how many times in my life I've needed somebody to carry me into the presence of God. And so now, I don't want to live a selfish faith. Because my faith isn't just about me. There is somebody in my life who needs me to have faith for them. Because there have been many people in my life who have had faith for me when I didn't believe. And this is like everybody who owns a truck. They will not stop talking about their truck. Until they find out somebody's moving. <laughs> then they get very quiet. Then you start hearing things like, I've been thinking about a Prius. Very economical. But friends, if, if you own a truck, at some point, somebody's going to need your help. And can I tell you this morning, if you're walking with God and you have faith, at some point, somebody in your life's going to need some of that faith. They're going to need you to come alongside them, pick them up, and carry them, and believe for them. Because sometimes life gets too messy and too painful. And it becomes way too easy to give up, to lose hope, to lose sight. And we see stories like this all throughout the gospel. This man that had been lame from birth, I wonder how long he had been living in just complete burnout. No hope, no faith, I'm bitter, this is how I'm going to be forever. And then he had a group of friends look him in the eyes and go, we believe for you. By their faith that he was healed. So they see the disciples, they start healing and performing miracles. And it, it wasn't just the sick and the lame and the blind showing up on their own. Somebody carried them. This is the role of the church. That we go out among the people. Because there's people in your life we're struggling to hang on. We're struggling to hold on to hope. And they've been waiting and praying for a miracle. Never knowing. They've just been waiting and praying for you. To have faith for them. 
because there will come a time when you need somebody to have faith for you. This is the church. And we see this all throughout the book of Acts. And as the story end, all were healed and all were saved. And this is why it's so important to see miracles for what they are. Miracles being that they, they always point back to God. It's never about the miracle. It's always about the miracle worker. And miracles move us to God. Because if all you receive is a physical healing, it's not enough because your soul is still lost. They point us to God and they move us to God. But I know that there are people in this room, you need a miracle right now in your life. And you've been praying every day for a miracle. And I, I can tell you, with no prosperity gospel and no doubt in my mind, your miracle is coming. I just don't know if it's on this side of eternity or the next. But I know that miracles are a glimpse of what was, what should be, and what will be. Restoration is coming. Healing is coming. Hope is here. And so you look at this group of people and you go, man, how did this group of disciples who were scared, scattered, didn't really understand what Jesus was teaching, how did all of a sudden they turn into this powerhouse group that launched the greatest church the world's ever seen? It's because they realized one really important thing. See, before Jesus left them in Matthew chapter 6, gets his disciples together and he teaches them how to pray. We now know it as the Lord's Prayer. And the first line of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus, the Son of God, prays this. He says, Our Father. Jesus, the Son of God, said, Our Father. He didn't say my Father. He said, Our Father. He, he was inviting them into this relationship that God is, is not just my dad, he's, he's your dad. And when you understand that, that God is your father, that you have that level of access, can I tell you, everything in your life will change when you realize who your dad is. It's the only thing that can sustain you when life's not going your way and you've been praying for miracles and it hasn't shown up and you're starting to lose hope and you're starting to lose faith. Because on this side of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, something was clear to the disciples that wasn't clear before. They understood who their father was. It wasn't about the miracles. It was about something way more than that. It was about the miracle worker. And it all came back to who their father was. I remember a couple years ago, my son was about three years old, and I took him to a park, burn off some energy, and so I'm sitting in the shade at the park, again, because I'm, I'm very white, and so I let him go out into the sun. I don't think I had sunscreen for me or him, <laughs> unfortunately. And so he's playing on the park, and I'm just sitting from the shade watching him, and there was a group of older kids across the playground. My son was about three, so they were maybe six, seven, eight years old. You could tell they're a lot bigger fully fluent in English. My son was still kind of stringing words together, would slur his words. And so he started making his way over to these kids because, you know, what does every young kid want? They want to be in with the older kids. And so in my head, I was like, great, socialize, don't be weird, learn how to make friends. I was like, this is great. And I'm just going to sit here in the shade. And so I'm watching from across the playground. He slowly starts making his way up to these kids on the, on the playground. And there's a birthday party happening. And Somebody had let go of a balloon, and so it's just floating off into the atmosphere. And these four or five, seven, eight-year-old kids were commentating on this balloon floating away. Like it was ESPN. And they're just all talking about it. They're pointing at it. And so my son starts walking up to them, and he's, he's kind of like you know, half words, half gibberish. He's kind of like talking about the balloons, and he's getting closer, and nobody, nobody really hears him. Nobody pays him any attention. And so he moves a little bit closer, and he gets a little bit louder, and he's still talking about the balloon. And still nobody sees him. Nobody pays attention to him. So he gets a lot closer and he gets a lot louder and still nobody's looking at him. And so finally, uh, the kid closest to my son 
the biggest kid in the group. He turns around and he shoves my son and he says, we're not talking to you. And then I stood up. And I began marching across that playground in my head saying, Cameron, you cannot fight an eight-year-old kid. You cannot go to jail for murdering a child. And I thought, I don't care. I'll start a prison ministry tomorrow. That's my son. And so I start walking over, and I'm, I am hot, and I am ready to go and drop the swift hammer of justice on this kid. And so I'm charging over, right? Dad is on his way to restore order because for the first time, even from across the playground, I could see for the very first time in his life, look of insecurity on my son. I saw my son for the first time feel what it feels like when people don't want you. Because all he knew up until that point was that he was loved, that he was wanted because he spent all of his time with us. And for the first time, he knew that maybe that wasn't true. And I saw it in his face, broke my heart. I still see it. And so I'm, I'm charging up to restore order and to save my son. And as I'm doing that, he's looking at the kids, and he's looking back at me. And he's looking at the kids, and he looks back at me. And then he says something that made me stop dead in my tracks as I'm charging up to restore order. He looks back at me, and then he looks at the kids. He points to me, and he says, that's my dad. And I, I, it shocked me. I stopped. And I realized in that moment, the first time of him really wading through insecurity and feeling unsure about who he was for the first time in his life, he pointed back to me and he said, that's my dad. And I realized more than telling them who I was, he was reminding himself who I was. Because for the first time, he felt unsure of who he was. And so he was reminding himself in that moment, that's my dad. And he's never far behind. And he's always got my back. And I just want to tell you, if you're wondering how the disciples in the early church, how did they make it through persecution? How did they make it through death threats and getting jailed and all of these things? It's because, church, they remembered, that's my dad. When Jesus prayed, our father, they remembered and they realized that God is not just for Jesus. He's for me. And what a firm foundation that is for my life. So whether you're walking through divorce right now, whether you're walking through the loss of a job, whether you've been praying for a miracle, I want to point you back to scripture, back to the gospel, and remind you that's your dad. And he's never far behind. And he's always got your back. And he's always coming. But we also, more than just reminding ourselves that, we do have to spend the rest of our lives telling everybody else that's my dad and it matters because he's your dad too and the same love that he gives me he offers to you I don't want to live my life with a selfish faith I want the miracles and the good works and the work of Jesus in my life to always be pointing me back to God the miracle worker to always be moving me closer to God but when I walk through those dark nights of the soul, when I'm contending with pain and trauma, I want to look back at the Gospels and be reminded that the one who overcame death, yeah, that's my dad. And when I walk into spaces and places where people are hurting and hopeless and have given up faith, and I can lend them some of my faith, I want to remind them that's your dad too. Dad is never far behind. Can I pray for you this morning, Bayside Folsom? God, I pray each and every day as we are bombarded with lies, fears, with anxiety, depression, insecurity. God, we have so many voices speaking over us. I pray that you will remind us first and foremost that we are your child before we are anything else. And God, I pray for anybody that's been struggling. I pray for anybody that is wounded right now. I pray for anybody that's holding on to the last strand of hope in their life. God, I pray that you would bring people around them that could lend them some faith, that could give them some hope. God, the people in the room that feel like they're limping through life, that they would have people come alongside them and pick them up and carry them into your presence, God. 
God, for anybody who's struggling with faith, that they would have somebody in their life who can give them some. I also want to pray for everybody in this room this morning who has kept their faith to themselves. God, we've got good intentions. But God, I pray that you would push us, convict us, move us to not have a selfish faith, to not keep the love and the grace and the forgiveness that you've given us to ourselves. But God, that everywhere we go, we would spread it around. We would give all that we have because you gave all that you have. I want to give you an opportunity this morning with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Nobody's looking around. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've been trying to figure this out on your own, if you've been trying to white knuckle your way through life, and it hasn't been enough, if you felt like you haven't been enough, you feel like you just can't get it together, you just can't figure it out, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to say yes to something bigger than yourself. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to step into a new season where you're no longer defined by what you've done or what's been done to you. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to say yes to Jesus. So if you've never said yes to Jesus, in just a second, I'm going to count to three. I don't want you to worry about the people next to you. I don't want you to question yourself or feel insecure. This is a moment that could change everything else. A moment that could change your eternity. So I'm going to count to three with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you are ready to step into something new and to say yes to Jesus, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Wherever you're at in the room, would you raise your hand so I can pray with you and for you? I got you. I see 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 you. Your heads are down. Your eyes are closed, but you can make some noise. People are raising hands. Come on. I see you. I see you over here. I see you. I see you in the back over here. In the back. Yep, right there. I see you. Come on. This is the church. We show up broken. It's safe to be broken here. It's safe to be broken in the arms of the Father. Now, hey, if you raised your hand, if you made that decision to say yes to Jesus, in just a second, I'm going to pray this prayer. I want to invite you to pray with me. One of the things that we like to do at Bayside Adventures, we say that nobody prays alone. So I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer. Don't have to get the words exactly right. This is a moment between you and God. But we, as a Bayside Folsom family, we are all going to pray this prayer with you. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I cannot figure this out on my own. Today I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. Jesus, come into my life and lead my life for all the days of my life. God, we give all of this to you. In your beautiful name we pray. Everybody said amen. Make some noise for every hand that was raised. Come on.